revolutionized everything, right? Uh, you are able to sign up to various kind of services quickly and so and so. Uh, so uh, but let's say tomorrow you're a student, you're an NIT student, you have a wonderful idea to come up with a different kind of a system built on top of other. Can you do it? No, the answer is no. You have to get permission from the other UDA authority. So majority of the web uh, services, internet services that you see today are kind of, you know, they work fast, but at the end, you have to trust an intermediary. And that gets n number of problems. That's what Web3 solves. And especially in the field of finance, right? So there are about, if you just consider the asset under management, like you might have, you guys, you guys might have heard of uh, Warren Buffett's company called uh, Berkshire Hathaway or uh, BlackRock, which is the biggest asset under management. N number of banking services come under uh, uh, asset management companies. There are about, $160 trillion of just financial assets these third parties control, right? And tomorrow, imagine something similar to internet. Access to this entire financial backend was given to people like you, right? You can innovate on top of it and you can make it really, really huge. That's where Web3 comes into picture. That's the reason why, you know, people have been really pumped up about it. Again, if you do not understand, please uh, uh, let me know. If you have any doubts, please let me know. Now, this is the reason why everybody has been pumped up about it. Even though this technology has come, I would say Bitcoin came up some uh, 2009 or 2010. It's been hardly 14, 15 years. This entire market has grown to be a nearly, I think last time I checked, somewhere about $2.5 trillion uh, market, right? And something similar to how before, see, there were just taxis. Then because internet came up, this entire ecosystem of Ubers, Olas came, right? These businesses were not even conceived of before such a big business economic group. Similarly in Web3 also, because of Web3, n number of businesses are possible and that economy on itself is growing and whatever services that you build within the Web3 economy will make you money at the end, right? You should be building something that is native to Web3. That's the whole point of this. Whatever I wanted to convey to you is that whatever the real world people, whenever they say that real world use cases of Web3, blockchain, people talk about supply chains. These are not the real world use cases of blockchain. Right? These are like uh, when internet came up, uh, the local Hindu newspaper came online. Is it true innovation of internet or was it YouTube, right? Or podcasting. Podcasting was not even, you were not even able to conceive without internet. Something similar to this, without web, uh, just with Web3, there are n number of services, n number of economies that you are able to con conceive, which is not possible with the internet. And if you build any kind of services on this economy, you'll be able to make basically huge bucks, right? Uh, now, if I have to... Uh, categorize what kind of services can you build in Web3, right? So at the top level, there are about five different categories that are there and we fall in the fifth category, but I'll try to explain you uh, what, what has happened till now. <laughs> so first something, I call it as core networks or these are the main blockchain networks that have been done, right? One is Bitcoin. What is Bitcoin? Bitcoin is nothing but a decentralized network for store of money, right? So you guys might, might have felt inflation. What is the reason for inflation that is happening across the world? It is not because, you know, we are producing less goods. It's because our governments have been printing money like crazy, right? But for us to digitally interact with each other, we have to depend on banks. Uh, without banks, was there any possible for any of the two people to interact? I mean, share, share, share money that was not possible until Bitcoin. And Bitcoin is the base blockchain for money. Similarly, there is Ethereum. Ethereum, you guys might have heard of. Ethereum is nothing but a public blockchain for compute. If there are any kind of applications that require a finality, meaning let's say I transfer a particular transaction to you and the nature of the transaction should be such that it shouldn't be reversed at all, right? It should be final or any kind of application that requires finality. You can design these decentralized applications on Ethereum. It's like decentralized version of AWS. And it, it has um, this Ethereum as a market cap somewhere about $600 billion today. Uh, Bitcoin is somewhere about $1.3 trillion, right? Similarly, Solana, Filecoin is nothing but equivalent of S3, it, it is a network whereby you can permanently store your data. Once you store your data, nobody can delete it, nobody can edit it. And even if you die, right, that data permanently remains on that kind of network. So uh, any kind of interesting application that you uh, that you envision, which requires data, uh, you know, finality as well as non-deletedness, right? So you'll be able to use Filecoin. So these are the base, yeah. Yeah. AWS owns like physical servers. Yes. Like how does that work with Ethereum? Yeah. So where are the physical? Yeah. So the physical. See, basically Ethereum is an opt-in network where see in case of AWS, 
let's say tomorrow you are interested to add into aws network you cannot do it right basically aws can only increase the server space in case of ethereum the nature of uh, this blockchain is as that people like me and you can openly join it the only rule to join it is you have to give some let's say you have to use a pc now currently you cannot use a pc for <laughs> ethereum for bitcoin you can just run it using a simple raspberry pi machine so let's say you want to be part of the ethereum network you can run your own machine it could be a server you can plug it into the network and tomorrow i want to be part of the ethereum network i can also run my own server basically people like you and me who are running these servers right are the nodes on this entire uh, network and the only difference is that currently in ethereum there are about uh, i think if i'm not wrong 20000 nodes who are running across the world because of economical incentives why will they run ethereum node because they'll get ethers right if they mine these coins and the nature of this ledger is such that whatever the copy that you are running whatever the copy i am running these are all same copies and let's say tomorrow there is a computation that has to there is a, let's say you have written a program it says that you add two numbers right and somebody has triggered that uh, transaction on the network all our pcs will simultaneously make that transaction instead of one pc making it so that's how ethereum works yeah. so it's just like this what i understood like if i have a big server in my yeah. i can yeah. just use that to join the ethereum yes so yes that will be like part of the whole network. Yes, and you will be running the exact copy of what has been running on all other uh, people's server as well. Instead of AWS running one single server, it's ten thousand servers with the exact copy. Yeah. The thing is, like, what if I joined Ethereum like long back when my server was not really strong, mm -hmm. and now since like it's developed, they're running much stronger data. Mm -hmm. What if my server is not stronger than <laughs> other servers? Yeah, like, so automatically be locked down. No, see, for example, oh. at the end you. in a server what do you have you have compute have storage right that's all uh, compute is to mine something or some, uh, if you want to mine or you have if you have to make huge calculations right let's say now the ethereum network has increased its compute requirements as well as storage requirements if your storage was like let's say you were just running it on a very basic hard drive your the moment your storage space runs out you cannot maintain that node so you have to upgrade your node so with Uh, with the increase in compute and storage of these kind of networks, you have to upgrade your infrastructure as well. And the reason why you would want to upgrade your infrastructure because there are incentive in place. Uh, if you run your own Ethereum node, you can get uh, earn money in form of a native token Ether. Ether. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, so in case of Bitcoin, it is called Bitcoin mining. In case of Ethereum, it was mining early on. Now they call it as staking. Uh, so uh, instead of doing proof of there is something called as proof of work instead of mining something if you have your own ethereum you can just take it there is a algorithm uh, by which you can uh, hashing is not hashing was part of proof of work but basically you can stake your coins and if your node active acts dishonestly your entire money will go away there is something called as a proof of stake so in that uh, that's how the consensus is done in ethereum so basically my bitcoin is a blockchain for money ethereum is a blockchain for compute filecoin is a blockchain for storage right and this system has been i would say a very mature ecosystem since 2009 uh, bitcoin came up in 2009 and somewhere about 2020s majority of this we call it as l1s layer 1s right these are already established so there's no i would say there is no incentive in people uh, for like people like us to develop new networks because already that network effect is already set so next breed of solutions that you if you want to be an entrepreneur can, can think of is something called scaling solutions you guys you guys might have heard of something called as polygon right that become very very famous this is done by few indians see the uh, problem with layer 1 blockchains is that because this huge level of decentralization is there uh, the cost is instead of storing in one place you're storing in 10000 place so the cost will be high so just to give a uh, example right ethereum which is most decentralized if you want to store your simple passport size photo what would be the size of your passport size photo hardly 100 kb if you want to store 100 kb of data on ethereum permanently you know how much guess how much it would cost any guesses if you if you store it on your s3 it's pesos right not even 1 rupee it's 15 lakhs that's the price you got to pay for the level of decentralization security is there so that means that just because a blockchain is there you cannot just dump your uh, data there or run random programs right so this is the in inherent mechanism that is there in the entire network against spam because if you want to spam the network you have to spend your money right so as you see you cannot store lot of data on ethereum or you cannot process lot of transactions on ethereum bitcoin that's why people have come up with something called as layer 2 solutions solutions which are built on top of these base network 
which will try to make the transactions faster and cheaper as well, right? So this uh, this um, class of solutions are called as uh, scaling solutions or layer two. One classical example is Polygon. They, they were the poster child of uh, Web3 success in India. There's something called as Lightning Network, which is aiming to make transactions faster within the Bitcoin network. And something called as Optimism, which is again uh, Ethereum layer two based solution, right? And the reason why I'm trying to point out to you is this is the second class of products that people can build within Web3. But even this ecosystem is maturing right now. So there is not a lot of place for people like us if you want to build something in Web3 to go here. But again, this is an evolving space. Tomorrow, maybe you come up with a wonderful application with a 100x improvement or existing scaling solution, you'll be able to build one, right? Uh, next, this is the major part that I wanted to highlight. So something similar to how, see, who became very rich in Web2 world? People, these are not the newspapers who came online. These are the people who built internet native services, right? For example, YouTube or Facebook, Twitter. So without internet, this couldn't happen, right? Something similar to this, there are Web3 native services. And that is where the actual money as well as applications lie, right? So just if I have to give example, what kind of services people are building. Now, uh, as you know, I gave an example of any kind of blockchain, so Ethereum, right? need a basic cryptocurrency. Cryptocurrency is like it's oil. Without a crypto token, there cannot be any kind of blockchain. That is the base incentive mechanism that is there in a blockchain. Now, in case of Ethereum, again, this is very high level, but basically Ethereum, you need to stake around, if you want to be a miner, you have to stake around 32 Ethereum in that network. So one Ethereum is currently worth around four to five lakhs. So 32 Ethereum will be in crores. So let's say me, person like me and you, we have one, one Ethereum or two Ethereum. You, you could actually, uh, start mining and get gain more yield, right? But you cannot do it because you do not have 32 Ethereum. So how can people like me and you start pooling us uh, resources and start mining, right? So basically, Lido does that. So as you can see, Lido is a purely Web3 native service, right? Now, if you have to see Aave, Aave is nothing but a Web3 based lending service. So on the blockchain, there are n number of assets, Bitcoin, Ethereum, USDT. So can you lend, le can you lend and borrow these assets similar, similar to what banks can do? Obviously, you can do, right? Obviously, you would want to do. That's what Aave solves. Uh, next is Biconomy. So you might have heard that, you know, as I told you, you if you want to do any kind of transactions on blockchain, you need to pay in terms of its native token, like Ethereum. Now, uh, tomorrow, as a student, you want to write a transaction and you want to do any kind of any kind of uh, transaction or build applications on Ethereum or any other blockchains. First of all, you need to buy the cryptos. You have to submit the cryptos. All of this is complicated, right? So Biconomy has come up with a way in which you can just pay your rupees or dollars and start interacting with the blockchain. So this is again Web3 native. And something similar to this, there are other solutions, uh, which I'll just skip through. But the main point that I wanted to tell is, Web3 space as a whole is maturing. And if you're looking to build something, understand the base protocol and try to build something native to the Web3. Instead of you know thinking of supply chains, trying to think from uh, older principles, right? Okay, this is happening in our current world. Can I try to do it in Web3? That is not the right approach to see. And the final class I would say is Web 2.5 services, something similar to what we have had. Contrary to what I just told, try not to do uh, Web 2 services on Web 3. We are in fact doing that as a, uh, I wouldn't say hypocrisy, but there are n number of solutions which would be much more improved if at all you would do it on a public blockchain on Web 3, right? Uh, like, uh, for example, legit doc. I'll, I'll give you our example itself. See, what we do, we have come up with a SaaS platform for any kind of document issue or to issue, tamper-proof digital documents to the end user. So why couldn't this service happen before? So there were two problems. Before us, everybody, say for example, in case of NITK, you guys are issuing n number of degree certificates, right? And there is a system that is built by IRIS, I believe, to verify this. Similarly, uh, every other institutions build their own kind of microservices. There is no go-to platform that is there. Why there is no go-to platform? Because at the end, if you want to issue a credential and have a way to verify it, you need a third party. Here, the third party is NITK. Why would, NIT, why would NITK outsource it to somebody like me, right? I can manipulate those credentials. That's where Web3 come in, comes into picture. I can develop a system such that instead of trusting me, you can see the, see the program that is running on these kind of blockchains, right? And I have come up with a system whereby I have built a SaaS service on blockchain, all these transactions, certificates are getting recorded on the blockchain in a way, such that let's say tomorrow NITK wants to onboard this particular solution. They do not have to build anything on their own. They can just see, use my system. And instead of instead of Zappel saying that this credential is valid, it is a blockchain which says the credential is valid. 
that's the reason why you know web 2.5 services makes lot of sense so uh, one more like very good example i would say you you guys might have heard about something called as usdt usdt is nothing but a stable coin uh, so uh, and we are a bit fortunate to be in india whereby the economy is a bit stable there are countries which are experience like 100% 200% inflation every year and they do not have access to stable currencies right like the countries try to restrict access to us dollar a lot of people want to access us dollars but only way to access us dollars was via the banks right so and banks are blocking that but can if if at all if at all there was some equivalent of us dollar on the blockchain nobody can stop a blockchain government can't shut down a blockchain can not access that that's what tether or the team uh, team behind it uh, uh, they have done a stable coin called as usdt i've written the usdc usdc is a circle coin whereby what they have done in us uh, they have let's say they take 100 billion dollars of uh, uh, dollars against that they have minted particular coins on the blockchain and now these coins if enough people uh, accept them right uh, it's equal and instead of hold, holding a dollar on on a physical dollar now these are these uh, phys- digital dollars are there on the blockchain network and anybody like me can access them government cannot stop me from owning these right government cannot stop me from uh, you know selling it to somebody else so this is one of the, i would say the best use case of blockchain still now and usdt is today i would say somewhere about 130 billion dollars industry right so these are the breed of services yeah is it cryptocurrency very volatile yeah see for example usdt is not a volatile currency so it is pegged to dollar so the value of that is one so you are talking about bitcoin or these kind of ethereum right so these are all native tokens these are not uh, currencies per se so obviously uh, currencies like bitcoin and ethereum are volatile and people so for example why i own a lot of bitcoin because i believe that our world is undergoing lot of monetary uh, inflation in the next 10 years governments are going to print money like anything and no matter how much money you make it's going to depreciate so i because of the way bitcoin is evolving right now i personally believe that in next 10 years everything will like lot of countries will start migrating towards bitcoin because bitcoin is the only currency that even the us government will not be able to inflate right they cannot sanction it so yes the volatility is there but i see that in next 10 years it's going to be big thing so i invest in it but coins like usdt so these are these are stable coins so the value of that coin always remains for example it's a dollar stable coin it's always equivalent to 1 dollar so yeah so this so all i wanted to say is that there is a class of services called as web 2.5 whereby you can try to make existing services that are there a bit better you can think of uber right currently uber and ola they charge about 20% 20 to 25% commissions and drivers are not getting it maybe you if you had come up with a system on blockchain where you can connect drivers to the uh, consumers that entire commission can go to the driver or the prices can reduce right so this is a classical example for web 2.5 kind of services that you can think of uh again i'll not get into this but there are something called as wallet so then as i told you the entire web3 part runs on tokens now how do you hold tokens you can, the bank will not hold these tokens you need some kind of software infrastructure so there are a class of solutions called as web3 wallet infrastructure such as metamask phantom wallet trezor wallet so you can also if you want to think of starting something you can also think of starting something in the wallet industry as well and this is the last chart that i wanted to leave you with see uh, if you s- see all the technologies that have been there till now right the fastest growing technology adopted technology was internet today i think internet has somewhere about uh, 4.5 billion users and in a matter of like 20 25 years we have come here this is the technology this is the only piece of technology that has seen this kind of adoption rate right and web3 has even beaten this the the rate of growth of web3 the adoption that is there is tremendous i think we are going to reach about we are already somewhere about 600 billion, uh, 600 uh, million users within like one year at the end of this year we are going to reach 1 billion users which and and in case of web3 it just took 8 years in case of internet it took about 14 years to do this right and today you see all the wealth that is built on internet all i am trying to convey is that web3 is going to be very huge we are at a very early part of the cycle and uh, within few years it's going to be a multi trillion dollar industry and if you could think of if you understand web3 if you could think of something starting a business which is very native to web3 uh, you could be you could have you have a chance to become very very big right and i just wanted to end this with some of the success stories within india the classic poster ch- uh, child is uh, you know sandeep nenwal jayanti and anurag the polygon folks polygon mafia they built this layer 2 solution today it is valued at 11 billion dollars they are the first crypto billionaires in india 
these are a bunch of 20 21 year olds from hyderabad called jain brothers uh, without even a degree, they dropped out. They were, I think, they were in NIT Varangal or which I'm not remember. I don't remember. In first year of their operation, they dropped and started something called InstaDap, which helps people to uh, trade these cryptocurrencies, make lending and borrowing. Today, that has two billion dollars. That's two billion dollars is somewhere about 16,000 16, crores under asset under management. These, these people are millionaires, right? And one more example is Bikonomy. I just gave you an example of Bikonomy, what it, it does gas this transaction. And within a matter of three years, basically Aniket Jindal, they have built a company which is valued at around $600 billion. So with this note, uh, I know that it is something new. It was a bit boring, but the uh, whole gist that I wanted to give you is, have a look at Web3 from a serious lens. So you see, if you see, if, if you want to start something, what are the tech frontiers that are there? One is AI. Everybody is talking about AI, right? But is it easy to build on AI? So I'm not talking about, is it easy to build a foundational AI model? It's not possible. It's not, even though people say that models are open source, we do not have data to train it, right? Only these fan companies have access to it. So it's very, very difficult to build a AI company. And let's say you try to build a wrapper on ChatGPT. Tomorrow, ChatGPT can just come up with the agent function and disrupt you. That's what is happening with n number of uh, companies right now, right? And I believe that, yes, if you're, uh, ingenious in case of AI, you can come up with some kind of system, it might click, right? But in case of Web3, everything is open source. Uh, everything is, there is no, uh, I would say, uh, point of uh, restrict, so, some huge third party who restricts some data so that you cannot build something on top of it, right? Maybe somebody has built a system on in US, you can just borrow it, tweak it, and spin your own system, right? That you cannot do it with an AI, uh, AI unless they license that particular product to so my uh, end remark is that this is a huge market. Uh, in the next 15 years, it's going to surpass whatever you see on Web2, especially for the financial market. And uh, if you could think of coming up with something, becoming part of this economy, uh, you'll be able to do great. And you have a better chance of doing it. And uh, I would say that, see, I'm a civil engineer. Like, uh, what were the chances of me going into tech and building something that governments are accepted? And we have come to a certain level, right? Only way that was possible because the entire Web3 thing is open source and uh, there is nobody else uh, that can stop me from building something like this. Thank you. With that, I'll leave a note. If you have any questions, happy to answer them. Otherwise, we can wind up. So there are ways in which you can abstract away the front-end works and still maintain decentralization. That is the innovation that you can come up with, right? So that's the biggest UX. Whatever you are telling right now is exactly the UX problem that is there for people to come on board, on board on top of it, right? So one, there are for particular class of services, let's say web 2.5 services, whatever you are trying to explain here, these are all for people who are using regular services, they want to migrate to blockchain, right? So this is a problem that is there. Uh, this problem will not be much uh, visible for Web3 native services. I was trying to explain you there are a lot of problems within Web3. If you try to solve them, this kind of UX problem will not be there. And ultimately, see, this, this, is, this is something called as network effect, right? A network takes time for acceptance. Network takes time to evolve. So even if you see internet, initial internet, uh, people call it is a fact. Like it, if you wanted to run an email server, you had to set up your own infrastructure. 
like do all and during that time a lot of people dismiss what is this like i have to host my own you know server to have my blog so this so you the net people started coming coming into it do it started improving so ultimately now uh, you can interact with any kind of website or come up with your own blog without even having to know anything about programming right i would say that crypto is at a particular stages of adoption right now whatever the ux problem that you are saying right now right so it's going to get solved story story for example we solved the ux problem for documents in india That's the reason why you see the adoption here. Uh, even though it is on blockchain, crypto, as you said, governments were very hesitant to do it. On like, why would they want to own Ethereum token, interact with it? That doesn't work, right? So we came up with a way. We have patented it. Like why right? for for a government or enterprise, it's a simple application, as if you are doing a simple prompt. But the backend architecture interacts with the blockchain, and they have full sovereignty over what they do. Do you think that for the kind of semi decentralized to this? Uh, yeah, yeah. So, so I would say that semi. Uh, so most of the Web 2.5 services, right? These are kind of semi decentralized. Okay, for example, in our case, also, I wouldn't say that they are completely decentralized. So I have a front-end application that is running. There is a admin management system which I have built on top of this kind of stuff, right? But ultimately, the transactions are getting on block, anchored on blockchain. So the right approach for adoption right now is kind of semi decentralized. For example, I gave you the example of Polygon. So scaling of Ethereum was a huge issue for everybody. And everybody was talking about rollups. Uh, you might have heard of something called rollups, uh, side chains, or whatnot. And people frowned upon side chains. So side chain is not actually decentralized chain. But what did Polygon do? They forgot about all of this. They see they saw what the market wanted. Market wanted to access Ethereum in the most easiest way possible. So they built a semi-decentralized solution called uh, Polygon, which is a side chain. It's not actually a chain on top of Ethereum. And today they are where they are. So as you are rightly telling, the approach for us to get more people will be a semi-decentralized uh, solution, where which will, which will ultimately uh, go towards <coughs> pure decentralization. And uh, I think for that stage, some people like if you have your iPhone, your wallet is part of the iPhone, and if you want to sign any transaction, it is just putting a fingerprint on the. So I think that will be the ultimate unstate, end state, but we, I'm very sure we are going there. Right now, we see how OIDC and all that you know moving towards the decentralized basically. Basically, there was for the backend protocol and all that. It's not know. decentralized distributed. There's a difference. It is. It's just a. It's just like the entire idea. Why people like that because it's decentralized. Like, there is not one person controlling <coughs> all of the individual nodes who are paid in and um, I mean, let's say most because you can't like data tampering and all of that stuff. But OIDC is working because. There is no one central authority. All of them directly coordinate with the consumers and like with the customers and stuff. So how do you think? Like, do you think that is a problem in the web three space or something? We can improve the OIDC architecture by working. See, so there's a huge difference between distributed systems and decentralized systems, right? So, uh, distributed networks. Can be resilient network. So if you see the evolution of networks in computer science, like the centralized network, distributed network, then there are decentralized networks. Decentralized networks are the kind of networks whereby, uh, if a rule has to be enforced across this network, all the nodes have to agree. But in case of ONDC, like you are saying, it is distributed. Tomorrow, a protocol of ONDC has to be changed. Can the government change it? Yeah. So basically, ONDC is run by who? The Digit Foundation. I mean, we are working with the Digit Foundation. So basically. Even though you say it is a distributed mechanism, right? Or let's say even UPI. UPI is so convenient. Ultimately, things can be changed with the click of a button with the centralized tools, right? And especially, see, this may not make sense a lot of for applications like ONDC, but a lot of financial applications makes a lot of sense, right? So you consider remittances. So we have wonderful tech today, like instant transaction. You know how long it takes to do a remittance transaction, even in this day? It takes about two to three days if you want to send some money to US. And they take it. Recently, we made about 50k USD of some transaction. We invoiced to a foreign client, and they uh, they deducted around two to three percent of the fee of the entire amount. So such kind of problems are there. Like the UX is wonderful, right? You can come up with a very distributed system, but ultimately, who owns the system is what the problem blockchain solves. Yeah. Uh, so I have a Because like by obviously they cannot ban cryptocurrency, what they can definitely do is kind of uh, prevent people from uh, converting their rupees to crypto. 
and like they also have a good motive to do it right? because yes. this has a strong environment. See, that's a concern with any, any upcoming technology, right? So if you study any any technologies now, obviously in India also the government ideally wants to ban cryptos, but they cannot, and they see that US is recently US did a, did order out of the ETF, right? So Indian government is also hesitant that you know will be left behind. It's the case of classical case of net, network effect. Initially, the existing incumbents will try to resist it. Whenever IC engine came up, your regular cars came up, the so old cross associations told that hey, we'll lose our job. They tried to resist it. We know this history of like if you study the history of adoption, any kind of technology, existing players always try to push back against it, right? And this is how technologies evolve. But it's just that there is a concept called as overturn window. Slowly, 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 if the next system is more efficient compared to the previous system, right? Uh, because of the market dynamics, we have a natural instinct to switch to that system. For example, people, governments are trying to risk, uh, not go into Bitcoin, right? not adopt Bitcoin. But if there is a, there is a small government, Sri Lankan government, they see that if I adopt it right now, and at a later point of time, some, somebody else adopts it, I might be the first more advantage. So people like Sri Lanka start adopting. One by one, person starts adopting. So overturn window changes, and ultimately they have to come. So obviously, see, the regulation is a concern in India. And uh, especially in India, what they have done is they have put a 1% TDS on all the transactions. And if you make any money out of crypto, you have to pay 30%. So that's the way to uh, make people transact less with crypto, not ban it completely. But I think they will. that is a losing uh, battle that will be to do. Uh, yeah, so. Uh, uh, it's just, even I'm surprised that you know uh, we, we are where we are. So as I told you, after NITK, I uh, I got placed into a PSC called as Bell. I was a civil engineer there, and uh, I was more fascinated with uh, these cryptos. I I, got, I bought my first Bitcoin in 2016 when I was a student like you, and it was I think probably 50, 000, 15,000 rupees or something. So I was into cryptos, and I was good at programming. Uh, I wanted to. I was top, even though I was civil engineer. I was good at programming. I was top of the class in first uh, first year as well. And once I went to uh, you know the my workplace, I didn't like the workplace. And after this, uh, I I thought I have to do something. And if I have to do something, it has to be there on the on the internet, right? It's not a physical thing that I want to do because that internet-based services you'll be able to scale to the world, and you have a better chance of making big. Right? And within the internet, what fascinated me was that thing. So I was like, I want to do something in that. Thing. And during that time, uh, interestingly, in 2019, it was MIT USA, Massachusetts. They, they were the one who came up with this concept of issuing documents on blockchain, right? So I got fascinated with that. So they were like, okay, in India, there's a huge problem of forgeries. Can we solve this problem using this? Yes, that is the best way to solve it. But uh, the way MIT folks had built this solution is such that, uh, you know, you needed a crypto to transact with it, as you told. Right? So that's not possible in India. So then I contacted, uh, there was a uh, tech genius at a company who was very famous, getting very famous. Uh, who had offers from Google but left that for serving the nation because Bell was a defense organization. So I met him, I explained what I want, what we wanted to do. That's how we came up with the system. Then uh, for us, personally speaking, it was very difficult to sell this because we were trying to sell a crypto native solution to enterprises. And enterprises were most averse with anything crypto because governments were averse against it. Right? So we had this chicken and egg problem. Wherever we go, people will say that if somebody has adopted it, I'll do it. Right? So we stopped about uh, one year. Luckily, we had a full-time job. We did uh, we did it part-time. And finally, for us case, what worked is we started participating in a lot of government competitions. That's what uh, B2, B2B companies can do. And luckily, I would say we won uh, one competition called Maharashtra Startup Week Challenge, uh, which selects 20 startups across the entire India uh, in two uh, respective fields and gives them a direct work order without any tender, right? So that's where our journey started. And once we did it, we got a reference and we were the pioneers in India. And now, luckily for us, in India, there is something called as national blockchain policy. So India has passed a policy called national blockchain policy, which recommends that majority of the state government in the next five years migrate to blockchain for 44 use cases. One of them is blockchain credentials. And we happen to be the pioneers in it. So that's how uh, things started the five years. Obviously, this is a short version. So. Uh, I would say it's a matter of grit, a lot of luck, and uh, we were in the right place at the right time. Okay. Two questions. You said that you worked on it while you were still at uh, Moonlight, basically. So, like, 
like when we join a girl, we have to sign this contract. How do you navigate that? Like, did you not have the yeah. ID? Yeah, yeah, see, I was a government employee. I cannot own a company. See, if you are very much determined, you can open it in your mom's name. Do it. <laughs> That's what we did, right? Like, we, were, uh, we were not uh, legally, as per the thing, we were not bound to do it. But if, if at the end, right, if you want to do something, you'll find a way to do it. So for uh, two to three years, uh, we did a different entity. On top of that, uh, we started operating this informally. And luckily, there was a lot of support from my own boss, who was within the government, who was fed up with what, with what he was doing, that you do this. So, there was a fundamental file crunch that said for data storage. Yeah, this like, is data storage. Uh, how does that come to your top? Like, like for storage and streaming, mm -hmm. why would someone use a blockchain and not like a dot network? See, so like an anonymous server. Yeah, see, so <laughs> the same thing was in a way. Uh, they work on a similar mechanism. It, it's just that the tower network, the incentive for you to join the tower network is because if you want to kind of you know sync with the tower network, to download something or uh, upload something, right? Uh, especially for data streaming, tower works very well. It's just that with, with respect to Filecoin, the crypto incentive part is the reason why you would join a network. You have two options. One is people who can who want to join the tower network are the ones only who either want to download something, right? Like basically from the network. That is the only incentive that you have. So the network which you can build with Tor is minimal. But with the file coin, the incentive is if you join, if you have spare, uh, spare compute, uh, it's lying somewhere, you can get native coins. Basically, you can get money against it, right? So, uh, cryptos build a better incentive model compared to networks like Tor. Are we solving the same problem? I would say uh, yes, but it's just that, say, Tor network, you can store media, you cannot program it. Can you program? Uh, things so on top of file coin, you can basically run automated programs along with storage. Is there any more Bitcoin twenty sixteen? Like, like that's very early for the year. Yeah. Uh, what like are you doing like you know? Uh, what do you get? Are you aware of? Uh, so when we were in uh, uh, college. Uh, I think your NTK uh, network was very much restricted. So we were actually exploring. So we were these end uh, engineers we were doing number things. We were actually uh, exploring the dark web. To be honest, so on dark web, so so we had heard heard of something called a silk net uh, silk network. Probably you might not have heard of this. Right? People used to sell drugs on that. Not in India, abroad. So we were just curious. How does this network work? Like, what does it look like? So we went to, uh, went to that uh, dark web. And there was this concept of pay with Bitcoin. I'm like, what is this Bitcoin? That's where the curiosity started. And uh, again, I'm not trying to sell Bitcoin to you. Please don't buy Bitcoin. I would say that take, uh, spend about 100 to 200 hours on this technology. What it is, why it is. So when you enter into Bitcoin, then you ask, end up asking the question, what is money? What has been the evolution of money? And why are we using the money, the paper currency we are using, right? So once you go through this journey, the, I think the ultimate conclusion will get, get into is probably Bitcoin is going to be there. I would say that. Even compared to blockchains, Bitcoin is going to be the one of the important technologies of our century. Something to look at. Yeah. But like after every four years, it's like a bad thing. Yeah. Like, no, the whole point of Bitcoin is they want to have a fixed supply <coughs> compared to this uh, uh, supply where governments can print any money. Right? So, for example, Indian government is printing 10% more money every year, 10 to 11% in the last uh, on an average in the last 10 years. That's the reason why you experience inflation, not because you know. Experience, services are going high. And uh, you might have heard of Venezuela, right? So, where hyperinflation happened. Uh, in case of Kenya, Kenya, one rupee became like one trillion, uh, that kind of scale, right? So, this gives an alternative model whereby you cannot inflate the currency. Nobody can deplatform you, nobody can freeze your currency. So, that seems to be a very, very good value proposition for a lot of people, given what is happening around the world, right? You might have seen Russia getting sanctioned by US, right? With one click of a button, uh, US sanctioned or froze the assets of Russia. If the assets were on Bitcoin, nobody can do it. So that's the appealing part of Bitcoin that people see. And the halving, whatever you told, is the way to ensure that after like 140 years, the supply stops at 21 million. Any more questions? Anything else? I think, I think a lot of people in the back are very, very good. So, Uh, thank you, sir. That was really uh, knowledgeable and valuable uh, session. Uh, I think, uh, uh, sir, I'll be calling Srivalsa, sir, to present a memento to you. Thank you for coming to the NTK.
yes, we learned a lot about Web3, what to do and the guidance. Thank you, sir, for uh, coming here and accepting to take a session.